The Meeting of the Minds, this is the interview discussion show that explores topics in the atheism-theism landscape in a civil and respectful manner. I'm honored to have with me Josh Ferris. Um, he is a recent graduate of seminary, and um, he has, um, and he lives here in, uh, on the East Coast where I live. So um, he and I had an opportunity to talk before the show even began, and uh, we have some very um, fun insights into the fact that uh, him being a recent graduate of seminary and being a theist and my being an atheist and our different opinions about um, the landscape of this particular uh, argument or discussion um, is going to be super fun to explore. So mm. how are you doing today, Josh? Doing well, man. How are you? I'm doing real well. I spent the day, uh, as you and I were talking about earlier, cooking lots of food. So, uh, having tasted all of the food that I've cooked, I'm somewhat in a meat coma. But I'm going to I'm going to do my best to be uh, cognizant, vigilant, and uh, in the moment uh, as we talk. But every once in a while, I might uh, I might fade into a meat coma because I made <laughs> I made homemade sausage today. So, oh, I'm so jealous. Um, so, as we were talking about earlier, I do have some introductory questions that I'm curious for you to answer. Now, for those of you that are watching. Um, Josh thought that some of my introductory questions were hilarious. Mm -hmm. Like he, he actually, after I gave them to him, he, he like repeated them back to me like, really, you want me to answer this? And I'm like, I need to let you know that there's a range of guests that I have on my show with a range yeah. of opinions. So we're going to go through this list and see how we do. So, uh, let's start with the basics. How would you identify or label yourself, Josh? Yeah, uh, I would label myself, identify myself in a bunch of different ways. Um, I'm a young adult, I'm married, I'm heterosexual. Uh, for the sake of this, uh, I'm also a Lutheran, uh, a Lutheran Christian. Uh, Lutheranism is a branch within Christianity. Uh, I actually haven't graduated from seminary yet. Okay. I'm in my senior year, so hopefully the whole audience didn't just stop watching as soon as they heard that I didn't graduate yet. Uh, I don't but, think so. uh, but as, as a Lutheran, I, uh, my tradition traces itself back to Martin Luther uh, back in the 16th century. And that's the primary way I identify myself. I'm studying to be uh, a pastor, uh, a minister, or we would call a minister or word and sacraments in the church. Okay. Um, if you don't mind, could you unpack that a little bit? So sure. for, the, for those of us that may or may not be familiar with what Lutheranism is uh, particularly or in general, what that worldview kind of is and how it differs from other branches of Christianity. Can you go into that yeah. for a hot second? Yeah, absolutely. So Lutheranism, like I said, traces its roots back to Martin Luther, who was a, a monk back in the 16th century who was seeking to reform the church um, and ended up in the process of starting a new sort of branch of the faith. Uh, so Lutheranism, as I try to explain it to the people around me, uh, Lutherans confess above all else a God of grace. Uh, a God of mercy, uh, a God of love and forgiveness. Lutherans care uh, less about talking uh, about the scriptures per se and more about talking about uh, Jesus. And so we believe the primary um, use and, and goodness of the scriptures is that it points us to Jesus, where we find a God who is loving and merciful. Uh, and so that was where Luther was coming from, was uh, kind of responding to a system that had a lot of guilt, a lot of shame, a lot of a sense of having to yearn and be better, uh, and landing in a place where he found God loving and accepting him just where he is. Okay. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to diverge from my normal introductory questions uh, just to ask you something specific. Sure. Uh, because there's a popular movement that... Um, that the the new covenant group have kind of been wrestling uh, wrestling with, and it's um, a, a branch of Calvinism mm -hmm. um, that has a certain apologetic called presuppositional apologetics. And if you're not familiar with it, that I, I don't think it's really worth going into it. You and I can talk about it off air. But I'm I'm curious um, how Lutheranism contrasts with Calvinism. Sure. So um, from my perspective. Uh, hardcore Calvinists are a little bit terrifying. Uh, this sort of the linchpin of their theology seems to be um, this idea of double predestination, whereby God has chosen some folks for eternal salvation, off in a beautiful place with rainbows and unicorns and good things, uh, and God has chosen 
some people for something else, uh, eternal damnation or hell, as a lot of people would call it. Uh, and that's just sort of it. And my response to that is often within what's the point of all of this? If all of this has kind of been pre-scripted through to the end, um, why, why, are we, why are we going through any efforts or any motions? And so Lutherans, um, they would respond that God loves all people and desires for all people to, um, to know God, to know Christ, to have faith. Mm -hmm. uh, we would trust that for those who have faith in Christ, um, they are forgiven and united with God. But for those who don't have faith, uh, we don't talk a whole lot about um, hell or about punishments. We believe that through Jesus we see that God is merciful and loving above all else. And so we entrust everybody to a loving and merciful God. Uh, Lutherans are really big on not having a lot of answers and just saying, well, we trust in Jesus. Hmm. I, I appreciate you uh, uh, explaining the difference between the two because sure. um, it, it's, it's interesting to hear within the label of Christianity, um, how different interpretations of the Bible can lead to, yeah. can manifest. Sure. Right? And, and it certainly manifests in different styles of conversation. And, uh, and I can't wait to get past these introductory questions to the uh, dis discussion section. Um, so let's move on real quick. Um, so I think you did a really good job describing what that worldview uh, is. Um, so how would you describe your interpretation of the Bible? Now, I break it down into two different um, differentiations. And let me explain what they mean so that, you know, you're not uh, shooting in the dark here. Um, orthodox, meaning it's the Word of God, period. Non-orthodox, meaning um, inspired by God, written by men, and prone to the... Um, frailties of man's interpretation as he writes things down. Sure. So using those kinds of definitions, how would you, how would you uh, describe your interpretation of the Bible? Yeah, with those definitions, I'm definitely uh, unorthodox, non-orthodox, gotcha. uh, not orthodox. But mm -hmm. I think a neat thing to be talking about later would be how my tradition and other Christians might understand an orthodox interpretation of the Bible that doesn't have to be literal and about the perfection of Scripture. Okay. Um, so move, moving a little bit deeper into uh, your interpretation of the Bible, sure. how old do you think the universe is? <laughs> I have no idea how old the universe is. Uh, I'm positive it's older than like 100 years because I've seen pictures from before then. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad you uh, went this route. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, Billions. I mean, I, I don't read a whole lot of scientific journals, but however old uh, the best science today thinks the universe and the Earth are, man, those are the people whose job it is to figure that stuff out. And I think science is a gift from God uh, to be used with our minds. And so I would leave that up to, to scientists and theoretical physicists to answer, but uh, a lot older than I think I can comprehend. Okay. So that, that pretty much answers the next question, which is how old is the, is, is the earth? Um, because I'm assuming that you would come back with the same response. Yeah, absolutely. I thought about pretending that I didn't think the earth existed before Jesus walked the earth, but decided not to. <laughs> that would have been its own conversation. That would be <laughs> cool. Um, but that doesn't get you out of this next question, which is what is your opinion of the theory of evolution? Sure. Um, you know, my knowledge of evolution is pretty limited. I know what I learned in middle school science and what I learned in high school science. Uh, in college, I was a liberal arts major, and so the toughest science I took, I think, was like oceanography. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not something I'm super knowledgeable about. Um, I think at this point, it should be obvious to anybody that evolution, uh, the theory of evolution, is valid and is a reality. Um, for me, I don't see affirming evolution as somehow uh, disavowing faith in God. Um, I think evolution is a tool that has been used by God and continues to be used by God to sustain the earth and to keep this great big uh, ball of wax turning. Um, but, I mean, so my wife got her wisdom teeth out a couple weeks ago, and the doctor was telling us how as our jaws have shortened, we no longer have space for all these teeth. And that's why wisdom teeth are coming out so much. And why now they're starting to see more and more people that are born without wisdom teeth coming in at all. Uh, and so to deny uh, evolution, I think, denies so much scientific evidence and just verifiable facts uh, around me. 
Okay. So what led you to your current worldview or beliefs? Yeah. Uh, I grew up in the church, not, I guess, a particularly uh, Christian household, if that's what people are still calling it. I had some rough years in high school and in college, like a lot of people do, just trying to figure out my way through the world, trying to figure out who I was and my own shortcomings. And what attracted me um, back into the church and college was a sense of community, a sense of inclusiveness, a sense of being loved just as I was right where I was. And so for me, um, community has been the primary thing that has drawn me back into faith and is still the strongest witness to faith. Uh, being a Lutheran um, uh, and the Lutheran emphasis on social justice and humanitarian issues, that has really shaped a whole lot of my worldview of faith not being about a personal thing where I try to be super and holy and make Jesus love me, but more of a sense of uh, us working together to make the kingdom of God here and now. So in those years that you were talking about, um, the high school and uh, college years, would you, were you ever at a point where you would have considered yourself an atheist? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe there was brief flashes here and there. Um, you know, there was definitely times I said, if God is real, then where in the world is God at? Why in the world is all this happening? What in the world am I feeling and experiencing? But uh, there's just been something within me, something burning deep within that has never really caused me to question God's existence or um, to abandon my faith altogether. There have certainly been times where I've been more faithful to, uh, to the faith that I feel God has given me, where I've invested more in my life of faith and paid more attention to it. But Never a time when I just jumped ship and really doubted. Hmm. Well, now, uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on is because uh, uh, in our interactions before um, before this show, uh, you had mentioned something really, really interesting. And it's, it's almost the opposite of what the new atheists consider their campaign to be. Hmm. And... Um, so let me let me put this in context uh, for one second. Uh, please forgive me and humor me. Um, so the the new atheists pretty much want um, atheists to come out of the closet, and this is a reaction against the stigma that the term atheist has in the community and in in the lexicon of you know American everything, um, sure. politics, um, conversation. Um, you know, uh, publishing, uh, philosophy, and, and things like that. Um, but you mentioned something that was the flip side of that coin that I'm really interested to unpack. And that was something to the effect of, because of the way the media works, the people that consider themselves Christians that are being advertised or promoted um, in the media almost make it embarrassing for you to come out as a Christian. Is that, am I paraphrasing that almost right? Yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, it was funny just the first time I met you and you asked me what I do and where I'm at when I describe myself as studying, someone studying to be a pastor. The second thought right behind that in my mind was, man, I need to explain to him what it means that I'm Lutheran so he doesn't think I'm crazy. <laughs> Uh, and I found myself, and you might remember for the next five minutes, kind of dominating the conversation, trying to explain that being a Christian does not mean X, Y, and Z for me. And I found myself, even with you, the perfect example, trying to distinguish very clearly what being a Christian does not mean for me. Okay. So let's go into that. I mean, you and I had that conversation, but uh, not everybody listening had that conversation with us. So right. um, of the things that you said to me, what would you be willing to reveal? So sure. pretending that you revealed to me for the first time that you are at the place that you are right now, what were those back thoughts that you felt necessary to explain to me? Sure. I, I had a bunch of back thoughts. Uh, I feel like because Christianity has kind of gotten wrapped up with conservatism just culturally in the, in the country, uh, because it's gotten wrapped up in a really weird way with patriotism in the country, uh, I really wanted to be quick to distinguish myself from right-wing extremism, uh, both in the political sense and in the religious sense. Um, so to try to distinguish myself as somebody who does not hate homosexuals, 
Uh, in fact, to distinguish myself from somebody who would even say that homosexuals are somehow uh, living a sinful lifestyle before God, um, I wanted to distinguish myself from those folks who think that all the Bible is 100% literal, uh, and so therefore we have to follow it because Jesus said it. Uh, uh, I found myself really wanting to distinguish myself from those people we see on the screen who stand more for what they're against rather than what they stand for. Mm -hmm. um, news stories of pastors burning Korans and protesting abortion clinics uh, and just trying to stand over and against some sort of cultural construct in order to define themselves. That's what I wanted to make clear that I wasn't when I spoke with you. Well, I, and I think that's interesting. So uh, one of the questions that I have for you is, um, well, before I ask you this question, let me give it a little more context. Um, so the purpose of my show, the show that you're on right now, is uh, to pull together theists and atheists, because being an atheist, I have theists on like you. I have theists on of a different flavor. I have atheists on that are like me. I have atheists on that are of a different flavor. Um, and I'm particularly interested in getting um, as many different opinions about, you know, individual differences of reality as possible. And the reason why I wanted to bring you on um, on the show is because I think that your perspective really fits into what the New Covenant group has as a goal, which is to bring together theists and atheists so that we can have civil conversations, right? And that's, it's super easy to have with you. Thanks. No problem. Um, but want, I could try being a little bit meaner. I mean, no, I could, uh, I please don't. Oh, I don't have the energy. <laughs> like I said, I just I just made six pounds of sausage. Yeah, I don't feel bad for you. At all. <laughs> I don't have the energy to argue. <laughs> um, but what I do have the energy to do is um, explore what that is all about. What the landscape, the landscape that allows um, Christians to hijack what the meaning of being a Christian is such that, you know, we live in a metropolitan area. So saying that you're a Christian means something different than living in a suburban or a completely rural area in the same sense that saying that you're an atheist has a completely different impact than it does in a suburban or a rural area. But, um, but I want to talk about being a Christian. I want to talk about what, what you think having studied mm -hmm. what you've studied, what your, um, I'm sorry, my phone is on the same desk as my microphone, so you're hearing some aberrant noises. Um, what your opinion of the landscape is of apologetics, such that, like, now it's aggro. You know, you go on YouTube, people are arguing, and it's two very disparate perspectives. You listen to CNN, they're bringing back Crossfire. Two disparate opinions. You know what I mean? You you listen to Fox News. You listen to MSNBC. Two completely disparate opinions. So I want to get you in on the conversation. Yeah, it seems to me that our culture has shifted to be that way in general, as you said. I mean, we're seeing politics now happening with brinkmanship. Like, that just seems to be the order of the day and the way that people work. And as our culture becomes divided, um, we're seeing the same thing between Christians um, and, and those people who aren't of faith, which... Uh, again, I find myself so quick to want to distinguish myself uh, from such people um, and distinguish my own faith tradition from such people. So mm -hmm. Lutheranism, um, I think I think what a lot of this comes down to, at least religiously, is, is a, a view, and it differs among different folks, of how uh, religion relates to culture. What is the relationship between church and culture? Uh, I read a book this last semester called Christ and Culture that kind of I looked at these five different ways that sort of Christians view how they should interact with culture. And for some people, uh, culture becomes the enemy that must be resisted and shaped and changed at all things, at all, at all costs. Um, and for my, my own faith tradition, culture is just simply a reality we work within and we seek to, uh, to help culture be, uh, as close to expressing what we would call the kingdom of God as it can be, but it's not something uh, with which we are at war and not something that, that we have to hide ourselves away from and cloister ourselves away from. Does that make sense? Yes. So how familiar are you with um, the philosophy of humanism? A little bit. Okay. So 
um, because that that seems to be resonating uh, amongst a lot of people that are attempting to bring together um, people that don't have such extreme opinions, right? Uh, in, in in the sense that there is an umbrella term uh, or a big tent under which all of us can agree on certain things. You know, we all want better things to happen in the future than have happened in the past. We all trust in humanity to a certain extent. Um, we're not relying on supernatural causes to make these things occur. Um, you know, we're being proactive, yada, yada, yada. These, these, these kinds of tenets. Um, how much value do you think there is in, in bringing together people that are secular and people that are of faith, theists and atheists, to work together to, because, well, I'll, I'll explain because in a second. How much value? How much, how much value? Uh, extreme, unestimable, uh, inestimable, ultimate value. I, I don't think uh, the why? notion that I'd like to get your opinion of why. Yeah, uh, I think that oftentimes the church uh, lacks resources that people outside of it can bring to bear to really make a difference in the world. Um, and I just think it's, it, it makes you a better person of faith. It makes you a better human being to be comfortable and exposed to people who are different than you, uh, and to be able to work with such people. Uh, I remember when I went off to Penn State where I did my undergraduate work and announced that I was going to be a religious studies major, some people in my church said, oh my goodness, I mean, by the time you're done with Penn State, you won't be a Christian anymore and you'll have lost your faith because you're going to be learning about all this stuff. I think when we create a culture where we're scared to interact with things that are different than us because it might undermine what we believe, that's, that's a big place of fear that we're operating out of. Uh, and I think getting together with folks that are different than us uh, and uniting behind a cause or just learning to recognize each other as human beings with worth and value uh, is always of incredible use and worth. I agree. Um, so I need to be a devil's advocate just for a second and uh, and bring up the, the fact that being good for the sake of being good is its own reward. Uh, that's my personal opinion. And I think that that's something that, once again, my phone's making like noises as it falls off my lap. Um, uh, people would agree that in general, you know, uh, altruistic behavior certainly has its own rewards. Um, yeah. But what about the idea that, um, and, and there, are, there, there are people that think this, that you should behave a certain way to prevent going to a certain afterlife. Yeah. Like the Calvinists, like you were talking about. Using that kind of fear, using that kind of guilt, using that kind of premonition of things to come to act in a certain way. Yeah, that's something that fires me up as a person who wants to serve in the church and, and as a Lutheran. Something that pisses me off, quite frankly, and makes me frustrated. Um, I think that is a unfaithful witness and does destruction to the message of Christ and to the understanding of Christianity that I have. Um, I believe that love changes people in the long term much more uh, permanently and fundamentally than fear does. Uh, in, in the times of my own life when I've been motivated by love versus fear, I've seen the difference. Um, and to be motivated by fear, as I read the words of Christ, as I read uh, the Bible, fear is not what I see uh, God speaking to people, but rather love, uh, mercy, grace, and forgiveness. So Lutherans, we have this beautiful distinction in the way we approach the scriptures and in the way we approach faith in general. And that distinction is law and gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and this is sort of the biblical hermeneutic that Luther came up with, the lens through which we read the scriptures. Okay. Um, and each serves a different purpose. Each does a different thing to us and in the world. And so for Luther, he was very clear to keep um, the gospel faithful to, to what Christ had said, that, that our right standing with God and the promise of eternal life and forgiveness is not based at all on actions or works, but on faith in Christ, on God's mercy and grace. And so when, when folks start talking about doing good for the sake of not going to hell, I think they've missed the whole boat. I think they are literally 180 degrees turned from where they should be. And I get where Calvinists are coming from with it, because they want so desperately to have some sort of clear proof that they're on God's good list. And mm -hmm. so if they can if they can just keep 
piling on the good works and they can keep salving their conscience. Whereas for Lutherans, we look at, at Christ and say, this is what we cling to, the, the message of grace given to us. Well, I just got a, a viewer comment as you were explaining that, and I'd like to read it to you. So, Josh, do you believe there is a place like hell that some people will go to to suffer forever? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, person, uh, I, <laughs> my, my church that I'm a part of, the ELCA, would affirm that there is such a place. Um, Many of my colleagues would. My, I don't know. Uh, to be honest, I think if there is such a place as hell, then it's probably empty. I believe that what God did in Christ for humanity and for all of creation was to reconcile all things with God. Uh, and that God's yes is bigger than any of our no's. And that Christ's sacrifice on the cross changed everything forever. So this is my personal belief that if there is a place as hell, uh, um, yeah, it's probably empty. That's that's what I'd like to believe. Okay. So and, and it, it sounds even more like you're reinforcing the idea, like a humanistic perspective where um, you're, um, your humanutics um, – in, in perspective of the Bible, seems to be really accentuating all the positives, which raises the question for me, how do you address the Gospels? Do you address them as um, actual Gospels of the people that they claim they are the Gospels of? Or are you prone to the more historical, critical perspective of the Gospels? And what would the more historical, critical uh, views of the Gospels be? I'm talking about people like Bart Ehrman, um, people that say that, you know, um, they were um, they were brought together and labeled as Gospels that belong to certain authors because they were based on fragments and legend that that was the case instead of like, you know, somebody blah, 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 Mark, sure. you know what I mean? Blah, 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 Luke, you know what I mean? Dear I, Jesus, I, love Mark. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Instead uh, of the, the yeah. love notes. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't picture God bending down and scrawling with a hand, uh, the scriptures. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think as I look at the gospels, I view the gospels in the sort of same way that Christianity has always viewed Christ as being both human and divine. So there is inspiration, but there is also human frailty since humans were involved in every step of the process. Uh, so for me, do I think Matthew was written by Matthew? I don't know, maybe. I mean, the best biblical scholarship thinks probably not. And again, I'm pretty much trusting in people whose field it is to make those sort of claims. Mm -hmm. But for me, whether the gospel's written by Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, uh, whether they're written by those individuals or not, um, I don't think change the importance of their witness uh, or the value that they can be to the world and the people of faith. So how familiar are you, uh, how familiar are you with the current uh, apologetic um, trends? Uh, I, I don't know. Give me an example. So, for instance, um, there were a lot of people who were uh, young earth creationists or even old earth creationists that used to use a lot of evidence. They, they tried to use a lot of evidence to support their claims. It's just that instead of coming up with um, results that, you know, naturalistic methodology would come up with, they came up with results that removing that particular variable came up with, which supported, you know, the Noahic flood and, and things like that 4,000 years ago and the earth being 6,000 years old, yada, yada. Um, and, and then it changed where apologetics no longer kind of has the I'm going to meet you at your level flavor, but they're at the, you know, the presuppositional level where it's just like, listen, even for us to have this conversation – you're presuming logic and logic and knowledge is born out of the fear of God. And so logic in and of itself, you're borrowing from my worldview, Christian worldview, to even engage as a non-Christian in this conversation. Therefore, your worldview is absurd. Wow. That's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a very popular. I mean, I'm summarizing it and I might be summarizing it poorly, but it's called the presuppositional argument where they presuppose that – um, the God of the Bible exists, that the God of the Bible uh, help, wrote the Bible, and that the God of the Bible can um, make men know such things that they are certain. Yeah, wow. Huh. For me, um, 
defending the faith, explaining the faith isn't so much a matter of evidence and facts and scientific inquiry. And I mean, this might sound like a cop out, but I think that the nature of the word faith um, puts it in a different realm sometimes than the nature of the word fact or proof. I or appreciate science. that. I appreciate that level of honesty because you're ad you're admitting, um, and I don't mean this as a jab, but you, you're admitting the the faith component of what you're talking about. Absolutely. I mean, if if I could prove God's existence, it would no longer require faith. It would just be sureness of knowledge. And mm -hmm. and I believe that faith is what God is after in, in people. That Lutherans have always upheld that we are justified or made right with God, not on our own actions, but by faith in Christ. Uh, believing in Christ. And, and faith, if it's based on sh uh, pure, sure knowledge and fact, it's, it's not faith anymore. It's a good thing, but it's not faith anymore. We're we're talking about two different realms. So what so, so what does that say about the philosophical and scientific uh, arguments that have been used in an attempt to prove for or against certain evidences, uh, like the Noahic flood or dinosaurs and humans living together and such <laughs> stuff like that. <laughs> I think people doing that have a real axe to grind oftentimes mm -hmm. and a real agenda that they're, they're seeking after. Um, and that to me is often a little bit obnoxious. Uh, and, uh, and I think it, it's not looking honestly at what the purpose of the Bible is meant to serve. The Bible is not meant to be a history textbook. I mean, you can, you can see that as soon as you open it up and see poetry in the first few verses. And so, but Josh, see, isn't that isn't that nailing it on the head? Doesn't this bring this conversation full circle to the point where being obnoxious, the the squeaky wheel gets the oil, you know, being obnoxious brings you more to the popular front, brings you more, you know, in in whatever platform you're talking about, you know, the more obnoxious um, news stories become the most popular one, the more obnoxious YouTube videos sure. become the most popular ones. So, the the fact that they're obnoxious makes them so popular. But what are they losing in the process of, of being obnoxious? What are they losing in terms of being able to be an honest witness to what it is that they believe and not alienate people and push them away? I, I think that when you, you become tell me. extreme, I, I think you rob uh, any sense of validity and credibility, at least within the realm of faith, when you become combative and obnoxious. To, to behave in that way and then say, but let me tell you about Jesus, this gentle, loving guy that's all about <laughs> grace and love. And people are like, are you sure you know him? Because this seems to be antithetical to the way you've held yourself in this conversation. For me, witnessing to faith and, and engaging in the defense of the faith, I think a much more effective way than arguing about evidence and facts is by telling stories. And I have found that people are much more honest and open to me telling them the stories of my own life and where faith has intersected with my life has been a whole lot more welcome than me trying to tell them about fossils and God trying to trick us with dinosaur bones and whatever other crazy arguments I can come up with. Okay. I got a couple more um, viewer comments that are coming in. Um, one of them is, uh, if God is all love, why would we have to be justified? Yeah, I mean, that's a deeply, deeply theological question. Um, and we could argue, I think, over what the nature of justification is, what that word even means. I, I view God as a, God, a being of, of perfection. Um, and one of the chief values of the creation story, I think, is to point to our alienation from God. Um, that are evil and our sinfulness and man if we need to talk about that I can just pull up CNN uh, in a tab uh, to see the brokenness that exists within the world that that brokenness uh, is something that separates us from the sort of uh, love that God desires for us to experience the abundant life that God desires for us to experience and so I don't view justification just as a thing that's future tense I will be justified but I view it in a in a past tense I have been justified and most importantly for me in this present tense of, of justification with God means a different sort of life here, uh, an abundant life here, a life that's oriented not towards myself, which I think is the nature of sin to curve in on oneself, but is oriented towards the neighbor. 
Uh, so I, I would talk more about justification, not just as this future event where I get to hang out with angels and harps maybe, uh, but as, as a present reality in my life. Okay. Um, and here's another viewer comment. This seems to be a little bit more a controversial. So, um, so prepare yourself. Uh, the last book that Luther wrote was The Jews and Their Lives. And in it, Luther prescribes various ways to kill Jews. How do you view this as a Lutheran? Uh, awful. Um, it's abominable. Uh, for me, being a Lutheran doesn't mean that I follow or worship Luther. Uh, and the truth is, Lutherans have had to apologize often for Luther since then. Just a few years ago, we had the opportunity to reconcile with some Mennonite brothers and sisters over Luther's actions and words towards them during the Reformation. Uh, in my opinion, whenever Luther sort of got away from talking just about the gospel, he often kind of sucked and missed the point and was a jerk. Even his writing style uh, was sometimes horrible. Uh, and for me, it's important to affirm that I worship and follow Jesus Christ and not Luther. And uh, I can uphold what I think was Luther's valuable insights while still saying that I have no place for hate or persecution of any people, um, regardless of their faith or worldview. Mm. I just need to let you know that uh, another viewer comment came in just uh, testifying to the fact that that was an amazing answer. So honest. So let's move on to the last part of the, um, the last uh, couple questions that we have. Um, and these are the prescripted questions that we were talking about, the last, the concluding questions. So let's start with the first one. Would the world be better off without atheists? <laughs> uh, my answer would be no. I don't think, I think that diversity is one of the greatest gifts that we have. And I think that diversity is part of what makes us human. Uh, I understand that some Christians weren't, wish there weren't atheists. I certainly wish there weren't uh, extreme atheists who are pushing a worldview of anger, but I certainly wish that there wasn't extreme Christians who are pushing a worldview of anger too. And I think you find that in any people group. But uh, I don't think the world would be much better without much of any people. Excellent. What evidence would disprove your worldview or position? Well. We get back to this word evidence again, uh, fact, uh, reason, logic. I don't know what evidence would disprove this worldview. Probably a lot, especially if you have the biblical hermeneutic of literalism. Uh, I think for a lot of people, what disproves many of the claims of Christianity is people uh, who don't look at all like Jesus and who um, cast doubt as to if this Jesus guy is real and he supposedly lives inside of you somewhere, how come you don't look like him at all? Hmm. Um, what, uh, let's see, what question would you most like to be asked by an atheist? You want to go out to lunch? That would be nice, huh? Just to get to know people. I think that oftentimes when we assign labels to folks, uh, we think we know everything there is to know about them right off the bat. And it's really easy from there to dehumanize somebody. And so I want the opportunity to see an atheist as a human being uh, who has a name and has a past and has a story and has uh, a reality with them. And I want them to see me not as a Christian or a Lutheran, but as Josh Ferris, who's a human being and, and stands for certain things. Excellent. And what question would you least like to be asked as an atheist? Well, probably the one that you asked. Uh, offer me conclusive proof that God is real. And I understand why people want that. But the reason I just don't want to be asked that is because there's no adequate response. Okay. Um, and it's a hard place to start a conversation when you begin there. Okay. And what's the best argument you've heard against your position? <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to discount some of the crazy things that I've heard. Uh, <laughs> I think the very notion of Christianity's central claim that God became incarnate as a human being uh, in Palestine in the first century and died as a human being, nailed to a cross, it sounds ludicrous. It strikes against our nation of what, our notion of what God should look like. Uh, it strikes against the notion of what humanity should look like. I think uh, it's a pretty bold and crazy claim to make. And so uh, I understand why people can't get past that initial claim. Whereas for me, something that seems so crazy and unlikely 
because I've seen God at work in crazy and unlikely places in my own life, that makes me all the more curious and allows this crack of curiosity that says maybe there is something to this uh, because this couldn't be any sort of human creation. Nice. What's the worst argument you've heard against your position? The worst argument. God can't be real because God didn't answer my prayers. Hmm. I think, and I don't mean to demean people's experiences uh, of pain as they're praying for something desperately, you know, as their loved ones are suffering, as they're going through a hard time. Um, and so I don't mean to demean that. And I've certainly asked in my own life the questions, why has God not answered the prayers that I have offered? Um, but I think that that, again, is sort of evidence of our human nature to be curved in on ourselves. And so we think if there is a God, then God needs to be sort of this genie that I rub the lamp and God does what I want from heaven. Uh, and I think that that is just the most human way of looking at God and, and not the right place to start. If you could choose a representative to answer the question, does God exist? What field would they, uh, would their work be known for? Hmm. This is a hard question. I don't know people in a lot of fields. I only read one or two types of books here at school. I think, yeah, Bono is who I'd go with. Uh, <laughs> Because his music is legit, and I think that U2 has allowed people to ask questions, deep questions of faith that might not have had the opportunity otherwise. But more importantly, I think Bono is a guy that gets that Christian faith expresses itself through love for our neighbors. Um, that it's not about me reaching a higher point or a higher pinnacle or being perfect, but about serving my neighbor in love. And I think he is a fantastic example of that. And he has a cool accent. You can't argue with a guy that sounds that awesome. You kind of can I mean, I, I know I can. So that, that was a great response. Um, and last question, would you expect to find God if the Bible were not here to guide you? Hmm. Community and people. I think some of the most clear instances of God at work that I've seen have been through the people around me has been through community embracing me and loving me just as I am and accepting me. Uh, through community lifting me up and carrying me through hard times and being a source of support and encouragement. Um, for my own faith tradition, we believe the Bible's great because it reveals Jesus to us. But what we're all about is not taking the Bible literally, uh, but about clinging to Jesus Christ and the gospel. And so in the church, I have found the public pronouncement of the gospel to be the thing where I find God at work most through the people around me. Great. Uh, Josh, I want to thank you very much for taking some time out this afternoon to uh, talk to me about uh, your beliefs, uh, your training, and your perspective on the questions that I had for you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. No problem. I want to let the people know that uh, that are watching that I'm going to be recording a little post-show wrap-up where I talk about my personal impressions on how horribly this interview went. Wait a minute. <laughs> no. What I meant to say was how fantastically this interview ah. went. And I'm going to post that on my YouTube channel. Now, for those of you that are unaware, there are several ways that you can get into the discussion here. Um, you can go to Facebook and you can go to Meeting of the Minds and there is a, a group page for you to become a member of that you can uh, become a part of the conversation further. You can go to my YouTube page, which is user slash Mauti Man, M-A-U-T-E-M-A-N, and I will repost this uh, when it becomes available on the YouTube channel for the New Covenant Group. And you can also get involved in the comment sections of those. So uh, for anyone that is interested, please get involved. Uh, become part of the conversation um, so that we can have as awesome a conversations as I just had with Josh. Josh, thanks very much for hanging out tonight. And for everyone that's watching, I'll see you next week. Thanks, man.